Hello and welcome to the Royal Society's Centre for History of Science. Our speaker today is Professor Greg Raddick of the University of Leeds, and he's going to talk about the role of the Royal Society in the battle over Mendelism. Thank you. Thank you very much, Felicity, for that introduction, and thank you all for coming today. Uh, when I got this invitation, it took me a little while, much to Felicity's frustration, to figure out quite what I wanted to talk about. And I decided in the end that it would certainly be useful for me, and I hoped it might be uh, interesting for my audience here to relate my recent research to this setting, to the Royal Society. And not least, I hope this would be of interest because the period that concerns me isn't the high glamour period for the Royal Society. I mean, if you're anything like me, when you think of the Royal Society in the first instance, you think of the society in the 17th century, uh, the age of Newton and Hooke uh, and Boyle. And if you were to ask yourself, who do you put on that level when it comes to the 19th century? Uh, to give you three names, Faraday, Darwin, Huxley. We don't, at least historians don't, I think in the first instance associate any of them with the Royal Society. We think of Faraday, we think of the Royal Institution, which got going at the end of the 18th century. Charles Darwin and the Geological Society, which got going uh, in the early 19th century. And, the, and Thomas Huxley with the British Association for the Advancement of Science which was launched in the early 1830s. Indeed, so far as anything comes to mind in particular about the Royal Society in the 19th century, what comes to mind is a famous attack on the society by Charles Babbage uh, in a notorious pamphlet, Reflections on the Decline of Science in England and Some of Its Causes, 1830. The major cause in Babbage's view being the Royal Society. Uh, the Royal Society he compared very unfavorably with the Académie des Sciences in Paris. The Académie des Sciences, a scientific elite, conducted themselves in a scientifically serious way, in a well-funded way. Contrast that, said Babbage. I mean, it's quite a mean-spirited little piece of work. Uh, with the Royal Society, where you have that, to us, attractive, but to Bab Babbage's view, dysfunctional mix of uh, scientifically serious individuals with the gentleman dilettantes. Right? This is still the society of which Pepys could be a member. Uh, so Babbage thought that the, the, uh, the society was part of the problem. And the history of the Royal Society in the 19th century, and this is very well told in a marvelous book by Marie Boas Hall called All Scientists Now. That's about the end of the story. The, the, the 19th century for the Royal Society is the history of professionalizing reform. A lot of what we now take for granted about the way the society is, who's in it, how things work, came into being in the course of the 19th century. Just to give you one example, the notion that on the whole one expects fellows of the society to be based in universities. That's true at the end of the 19th century. It's not true at the beginning of the century. And of course it's part of a wider set of changes which brought about a much more uh, significant entrenchment of the sciences in the state and in the wider culture. But the Royal Society played a very active role in taking Babbage's accusations very seriously. So I don't aspire to tell the whole of that story today. As I said, Marie Boas Hall covers the ground very ably uh, in her book. Instead, I'm going to focus in on select features of the story as they connect up with a debate which increasingly preoccupies me in my own research in the history of science. The debate over the introduction of Mendelian principles into the science of inheritance. Uh, a, a, an introduction which famously happens in 1900. So what I want to do first of all is to introduce you to my two main protagonists. And they are antagonists to each other uh, and they will occupy opposite sides of the debate over Mendel's principles and whether they ought to be the foundation for a new science of inheritance or on the contrary, whether that would be a massive mistake. 
I'll then tell you a bit about the debate that raged between these two and their allies in the early years of the 20th century. Uh, but then in the, in the latter part of the lecture, I'll go back over parts of the story, slow down, and look at moments where it seems to me the Royal Society pokes through in ways which are instructive, both for thinking about the society and how it had changed over this professionalizing century, but also for understanding the debates over Mendelism, why they had the shape they did, and maybe even why they concluded the way they did. So this is the first of my protagonists, Walter Frank Raphael Weldon. He was born first of my two, so we'll start with him. Uh, Raphael to his friends. He was born into a wealthy and scientifically engagé family. His father, Walter, was a fellow of the Royal Society for uh, his discovery of a process which transformed the manufacture of chlorine, which is also where he, he made his fortune. It wasn't chemistry, but zoology that drew Raphael Weldon, uh, took him to Cambridge in the late 1870s and early 1880s. He studied zoology in Cambridge in the heyday of evolutionary embryology. That is to say, the study of embryos, looking for clues to reconstructing the history of life. Cambridge was the center for it. Weldon was extremely good at it. And throughout the 1880s, uh, keeping up his association with Cambridge, he published a number of, to his peers, very impressive papers in evolutionary embryology and morphology. Good enough to get him elected at the age of 30 in 1890 to the Royal Society. Uh, his proposers included two of Darwin's protégés, uh, less well-remembered George John Romanus, and the very well-remembered Thomas Henry Huxley. So he impressed these men. And indeed, Darwin was and remained his great hero. And uh, we sometimes think of this period in evolutionary theorizing as the eclipse of Darwinian theory, but not for Weldon. Weldon was one of the most uh, uh, fervent and creative thinkers on behalf of Darwinian natural selection of this period. But from 1890, he acquires a second hero, Francis Galton, Darwin's cousin. We nowadays tend to remember Galton uh, for uh, his advocacy of what he called eugenics. And that's right and proper, but there was much more to Galton than that. And what really impressed Weldon and a whole generation of younger biologists looking for something new and different and uh, in their view more scientifically rigorous than what they had been doing up to that point was Galton's introduction of a thoroughgoing quantitative, and in particular a statistical perspective and set of techniques into the study of plants and animals. Uh, and Weldon through the 90s began to bring these two heroes together, Darwin and Galton, using Galton's statistical techniques and quantitative ambitions to transform the scientific study of natural selection. And his uh, most famous achievement here in the mid-90s was in a study of crabs uh, in Plymouth Bay and Naples Bay, where he attempted to correlate anatomical variation in the crabs with their environments by way of showing that certain features were adaptive and indeed were being selected. And it's remembered now as the first demonstration of natural selection in the wild. So his career remained on an upward arc through the 90s until 1900, he was appointed the Lineker Professor of Zoology at Oxford. And I should say that through the 90s, he was based here in London at University College London, where he befriended uh, his great collaborator, the mathematician Carl Pearson. So that's one of, one of my figures. This is the other. There are really only two we'll focus in on, William Bateson. Weldon born in 1860. Bateson born in 1861, into a different kind of family, an academic family. His father was the master of St. John's College at Cambridge. And indeed, throughout the period I'll be discussing, into you know, around about the 1910s, uh, Bateson remains firmly associated and exclusively associated with, with Cambridge. Like Weldon, indeed alongside Weldon, he studied zoology in the late 
1870s, early 1880s there. They became great friends and supporters of each other. Uh, there does seem to be a sense in which Weldon from the beginning, perhaps being that little bit older, always outshined uh, Bateson. Uh, and that might introduce an instability which is worth bearing in mind for what follows. But Bateson also published well through the 1880s, again in evolutionary embryology and morphology. And in 1894, still at a pretty tender age, he got his fellowship to the Royal Society on the strength of that work. Interestingly, it took several attempts. You can see it, you can look online at uh, the proposal form, and it appears to have taken several years. So that might be something to, to investigate uh, further. Now, by this time, 1894, Bateson too has become hugely impressed with Francis Galton and Galton's biological work. But he's become impressed with a different aspect of it than uh, impressed Weldon. Weldon, again, uh, began to remodel his own work in the image of Galton's statistical inquiries. For Bateson, it wasn't so much the statistics, the quantitative side of Galton's achievement, but rather his undarwinian evolutionary theory. Darwin, of course, stood for a view of evolution as gradual, right? small variations gradually accumulating in adaptive directions over the eons. A, an alternative to that view had emerged and been especially well articulated by Francis Galton, which is sometimes called saltational evolution. So on this view, you expect rather to find plants and plant and animal kinds to be stable over long periods, not in continuous gradual transition, stable over long periods, and then suddenly and rapidly transforming into new kinds. So leaping. Darwin in The Origin of Species quotes the Latin, nature makes no leaps. On the Galtonian view, yes, it does. You get stability for long periods and then leaps. That's what attracted Bateson to Galton's work. And in 1894, uh, after his election to the Royal Society, he publishes what he thought would be his great work, a massive tome, Materials for the Study of Variation, presenting all of the evidence in favor of a thoroughgoing, saltationist, anti-Darwinian view of evolution. Uh, and through the rest of the decade, he began to develop his ideas there further. In the book, he announces that the next step methodologically in understanding the real nature of variation, rather than the speculations of the Darwinians, the real nature would be on the farm. Experimental breeding programs. That, Bateson thought, was going to be the next step. And from about 1897, he begins to undertake that work at Cambridge with a few collaborators. And it's thanks to his contacts with that world the world of experimental breeders, in particular those who were studying the capacity of hybridizing to teach us new things about variation and inheritance and evolution, that he heard early on about the rediscovery of Mendel. So let me come on to that now. And this, of course, will be familiar to many of you. 1900 is still in our biology textbooks, the year uh, famously, when three European botanists, quote unquote, independently rediscovered Gregor Mendel's uh, data, uh, his conclusions about inheritance, and also his explanations for them. Now, the reasons why these three came upon the same patterns and the same explanations, and the reason why Mendel, this Brune monk who published a paper on experiments in pea hybridization, in 1866, suddenly became a talking point for them and throughout European botany are very complex. Uh, but for our purposes today, I want to just dwell on three features, and then we'll come on to how the Royal Society figures in this story. The first point I want to make is that William Bateson, between 1900 and 1902, gradually persuaded, gradually but rapidly, persuaded himself that Mendel's rediscovered paper, I should say it was not completely unknown, but it was very much a matter for specialists. Bateson over those two years persuaded himself that in Mendel's paper lay the key to a new foundation for the sciences of heredity. 
uh, the key to uh, a new kind of science, ex thoroughly experimental, thoroughly quantitative, and furthermore powerful, useful, the key to truly uh, successful plant and animal breeding would uh, come through understanding the principles by which it works. And Bateson announced to the breeders that in the years to come, they will become as powerful as the chemist, able to plug qualities in and out from animals and plants at will to create whatever they think the market will want. So that happens between 1900 and 1902. Bateson becomes more and more committed to the importance of the Mendelian program and becomes the great advocate for a new Mendelian science of inheritance. The word gene is uh, a back formation from genetics. Genetics was Bateson's coinage for this new science of inheritance in Mendel's image. So that's the first point about Bateson. Secondly, about, about Weldon. Weldon from 1902, by contrast, mounts an attack on the emerging Mendelian perspective on inheritance. And he begins that attack with a publication which includes this photographic plate, a plate of peas, if you will. And Weldon points out in the paper, among many other things, something that everyone you know, sort of notices, but which you're not allowed to take seriously in uh, Genetics 101, which is that no one else's peas look like Brother Gregor's. And this, let me just uh, walk you through part of this image. If you have a look at uh, the uppermost row, cells one through six. Well, of course, if you've studied basic Mendelian genetics, and it would be hard to avoid it uh, at really any level of education, you'll have been taught about Mendel's studying of binary characters, green seed color, yellow seed color, round seed shape, wrinkled seed shape. And everything depends on the existence of binary characters, characters which are either or. Well, to take seed color at the, at the top there, Weldon reports that when he ex actually examines seeds hybridized from hybridized pea varieties, he doesn't find seeds which are either green or yellow. He finds some, if you look in number one, which are genuinely green, and some, like in number six, which are genuinely yellow. But you also find in number two, greeny yellow, three, four, gradually getting into yellowy green. Right? You find in nature the variability which constitutes a continuum. You don't find either or categories. Now, it's easy to look at this image and think that Weldon's just sort of nitpicking or missing the big picture, which is the underlying reality that Mendel had the perspicacity to see through. And of course, that's a legitimate point of view. It's the point of view that we encounter in our textbooks. A part of the intellectual thrill of getting to know Weldon's point of view is that he doesn't look at, like, look at it like that at all. From Weldon's point of view, the problem with experiments a la Mendel is that they arbitrarily seize on certain kinds of variation and engineer into being experimental systems which treat those aspects of variation as if they universalized. So it's possible, Mendel showed us that it's possible, to develop races of P variety in which you will get the patterns that Mendel reported. But you could equally get patterns which were nothing like the ones he reported. You could get, for example, uh, P varieties in which greenness was dominant to yellowness in which wrinkledness was dominant to roundedness. It all depends on what you seize upon as your starting point. And that, Weldon thinks, and when you appreciate that point, the point about variability, and furthermore, the way that variability is itself the upshot of interaction at every level between heredity and environment, you won't embrace the Mendelian conception. So, Weldon begins to articulate this thoroughgoing critical point of view on the Mendelian perspective from 1902. Uh, and then, uh, just a photograph of the two of them together uh, in younger days. Uh, from 1902 to 1906, it's ferocious gloves-off debate between these two, 
recruiting allies to the cause, publishing against each other for their own points of view, marketing, in, in Bateson's case particularly to plant and animal breeders. Very heated. And the heat goes out in 1906 really only with the death, unexpectedly, of Weldon uh, at the age of 46. Some thought uh, death brought on by overwork, which in turn weakened him and uh, led him to uh, catching fatal pneumonia. Now, where does the Royal Society pop up in this story, beyond merely the election of the principles to the society? Well, what I want to do now, as I said, is to go back over the story and dwell on three elements of it in particular. Uh, to see what they have to tell us about what the society was like in this period, uh, but also what light, if any, uh, we can throw on the debate over Mendelism. So let's start here. The Royal Society, of course, was not literally here forever uh, in this spot. Uh, this is where it was before the present location, uh, in Carlton Terrace, uh, Burlington House near Piccadilly. So here is the scene. It's the 28th of February, 1895. People have come to hear a fight, pretty much, uh, at the Royal Society meeting room, Burlington House. Uh, we have a report uh, from the Science Gossip column. That was what it was called. Science Gossip in the Athenaeum from a little bit later. Here's what we read. The second special meeting for discussion was held at the Royal Society on the 28th. And the new experiment bids fair to be a decided improvement over the old-fashioned reading of papers, which it is designed, if not to supersede, at least to supplement. The subject on this occasion was variation of animals and plants and was introduced by Professor Weldon, FRS. The printed documents in the hands of the meeting were, first of all, the report of a committee of the Royal Society for conducting statistical inquiries into the measurable characteristics of plants and animals. Secondly, some remarks upon variation of Professor Weldon. And thirdly and finally, a contribution by Mr. H. M. Vernon on the effect of environment on the development of echinoderm larvae. Professor Weldon's opening statement, which was illustrated by lantern slides, was followed by speeches from Mr. Thistleton Dyer, Professor E. Ray Lancaster, Professor Alexander Agassi, the newly admitted foreign member of the society, and Mr. Bateson. Mr. Dyer illustrated his remarks by specimen plants from Kew, a wild Cineraria from the Canaries being placed side by side with the latest cultivated variety, and specimens of variation in the Chinese primrose also being exhibited. So those are cineraria. Those of you who are, who are gardeners, as I'm not, uh, w w will know uh, these ornamental flowers. We'll come back to them uh, in a moment because it's actually the cineraria displayed for the gathering that evening, which ultimately provokes months and months of, uh, of uh, debate in the pages of nature. But I want to pause here to notice the first of three traditional, but also in this period, progressive functions or structures of the Royal Society. Uh, and, and the first of these is its role in facilitating communication. And this is a, uh, a feature we associate not just with the Learned Society, but all Learned Societies. Many of them think of themselves in the first instance as existing to facilitate communication in print uh, and also in person. This is certainly true of the Royal Society, which we associate not, with those, not just with those fabulous meetings in the 17th century, but also with the philosophical transactions, right? aiming again to, to keep the news moving about what people had found out. Now, throughout the 19th century, as part of those professionalizing reforms that I mentioned at the start, attention was paid precisely to the Society's communications and attempts to improve them so as to improve the intellectual life and caliber of the society and the work it supported. The Proceedings of the Royal Society starts in the middle of this century, uh, publishing abstracts of the talks given 
uh, at the meetings, as a way of engaging the fellows in the life of the mind, uh, of the society. The move to Burlington House was an attempt, in part, to find a setting which would promote livelier debate and discussion. And, and we heard there in the uh, science gossip item that I read out th that uh, a new format for these evenings is being tried out at the end of the 19th century, deliberately stoking debate between people known to antagonize each other. Because by this time, February 1895, uh, Bateson, as I've said, had published his, as he thought, masterwork, Materials for the Study of Variation, and Weldon had criticized it in print. Weldon, who Belden, Bateson had thought was a friend. Weldon thought friends still criticize each other's work in print because that's how science progresses. Uh, so by the time of this meeting, it's known publicly that these two are on opposite sides of the question of the nature of evolution. So this is something institutionally new at the Royal Society. Um, and uh, the, so the three, the, the, uh, Weldon gives his views uh, at the evening session, and then there are people lined up for and against. One of them uh, was mentioned, Thistleton Dyer. Uh, William Thistleton Dyer was the uh, director of Q. He was thoroughly Darwinian, fully on Weldon's side. And of course, there was Bateson for the saltationist alternative. There followed in the pages of Nature a running debate for the next few months over the Cineraria and what was said at the meeting and what ought to have been said at the meeting. And, and the question that engaged them was about the origins of these ornamental flowers. Did the origins of these flowers, as compared with the wild type, and as documented in botanical records, vindicate Weldon and Thistleton Dyer's view, which is that selection is all? You get from the wild type to the ornamental varieties through gradual selection of naturally occurring small-scale variations? Or on the contrary, did it uphold Bateson's view, which is that you expect the ornamental varieties we have now to arise through uh, breeders watching out for sports, for freaks of nature, sudden wild departures, seizing upon them and making them the starting point. In other words, saltations. And the results intellectually were inconclusive, but they were pretty bruising socially. Months and months of Weldon and Bateson having a go at each other in the pages of nature. Uh, my own reading of it is that each man reckoned that he'd probably gone too far, but so had the other guy. And you get some sense of how this kind of a thing can, uh, can rankle, because at the end of the year, uh, Bateson sends Weldon a note saying, Francis Darwin, one of Charles Darwin's sons, Francis Darwin tells me that you think that I was avoiding you at the meeting in February. Well, you know, I wasn't. So that's the, that's the kind of thing that can happen at these meetings. They're places to, uh, to argue points of view, but also to snub or to be snubbed, potentially. Okay, so that's the first, uh, part, the first uh, role of the society I want to draw your attention to. Uh, its uh, role in facilitating communications. The second is in offering a home for committees. Another traditional feature of learned societies, including this one. Right back to the beginning, they had committees. But as you would expect, throughout the professionalizing 19th century, the committees grew in number and they grew in their responsibilities. Not least because this was the century when the government began funding science publicly in a more serious way. And it turned to the Royal Society to figure out how best to distribute this money so as to promote the advance of knowledge. The kind of thing Babbage was looking for, not to anything like the degree that he wanted to see it, but certainly a lot closer than was the case uh, at the beginning of the 19th century. Now the committee of relevance to our story uh, has already been mentioned. It was mentioned in that science gossip piece. Uh, I'll just uh, read the title again. Uh, the, uh, a committee of the Royal Society for conducting statistical inquiries into the measurable characteristics of plants and animals. Weldon seems to have been a committee stalwart 
during his years as a fellow of the Royal Society. Someone who just threw himself into the business of keeping committees going, making sure that they were well run, got through their business. And he occupied a number of committee positions over his years as a fellow. And he pretty much started this committee in the early 1890s in order to help build up support for the kinds of Galtonian statistical quantitative inquiries that he wanted to see more of in biological science. And he brought Galton on board to the committee. Uh, so things begin to change after that 1895 meeting that I just talked about. Uh, at the meeting, Weldon discussed, among other things, the crab work that he'd been doing. Well, Bateson thought that he saw fundamental problems with that crop, crab work, so fundamental that he really didn't think it ought to be funded. And he began sending letter after letter to Galton, urging that these problems were really serious and need to be taken seriously by the committee. Now, Galton, you recall, had uh, friendly relations with both men, uh, been, and each was cultivating different aspects of his intellectual uh, worldview. And so he, he came up with what he thought was a good solution, which was to bring Bateson onto the committee. And furthermore, to change its name from uh, a committee to do with promoting statistical work in the study of animals and plants to the evolution committee. Make it a broad church. So you didn't have to be signed up to uh, the uh, methodology that Weldon promoted or his views of how evolution worked. Bateson resisted for a while, but eventually he accepted the invitation. The committee was renamed and it proved a disaster. So throughout the latter part of the 1890s, this committee of the Royal Society, the Evolution Committee, became the main forum for interaction between these three, Weldon, Galton, and Bateson. In the course of which, Bateson and Weldon continued to antagonize each other with Bateson uh, proving to be uh, quite uh, skeptical about the desirability to fund the kind of work that Weldon wanted, and Weldon increasingly persuaded that Bateson was just obstructive. And this all came to a head at the beginning of 1900 when most of the committee en masse resigned in hopes that that would lead to the end of the committee and the rebuilding of something new which would be functional. But that's not what happened. Bateson hung in there, and Bateson revitalized the committee as a Mendelism promoting committee. And a number of the most important early publications out of the Mendelian program are under the aegis of the evolution committee of the Royal Society. And indeed, Bateson's first uh, funding for his experimental hybridization work at Cambridge around 1897 came from this committee. So Galton had good intentions. Uh, but that's how, that's how things ended up. So uh, the committee, the, the hosting of committees and the way that they function uh, is, uh, again, both a kind of timeless characteristic of the Royal Society, but has specific features uh, at this time, which seem to be consequential here. Okay. So from 1902, as I said, it's the gloves off debate between Weldon and Bateson and their respective allies highly public confrontation over the Mendelian perspective, whether it's well supported evidentially. And if there's one public skirmish that stands out uh, over that period, 1902 to 1906, it was the uh, skirmish in Cambridge at the British Association meeting in 1904, uh, where memorably the two sides squared off. Again, it seemed to be inconclusive, depended on who you asked to find out who won. But here's where the Royal Society played a role, and this is not a role, so far as I can tell, that's been picked up on before by historians of science. So the British Association has its meeting at the end of the summer, 1904. A few months later, the Royal Society awards its Darwin Medal to William Bateson. And this is the the, the third of my uh, hard-to-see words I wanted to, to, to bring to your attention. We've talked about 
communications, talked about committees. There's also commendations, a third traditional but in this era progressive function of the society. Part of promoting science, and indeed a number of sociologists of science for many years said a, 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 a vital feature to the good functioning of science is a public reward system, public recognition for those who really advance the field. Uh, throughout the 19th century, ever more of these prizes began to appear. One of them was the Darwin Award. Uh, Charles Darwin died in 1882. The award was founded in 1890. Its first recipient was Alfred Russell Wallace, given to those who do the most to advance the fields that mattered most to Charles Darwin. It's roughly how the, how the rubric goes. So autumn of 1904, the award goes to William Bateson. And in correspondence, which lies not too far away from here, in the archives at UCL, you can find Weldon writing to Pearson, uh, commenting on this award and what it means. Uh, in early November 1904, first we get just uh, one line. Um, I suppose Bateson's Darwin Medal will keep the heresy on a bit further for a little while. He adds, I can't resist saying, it makes me more than ever glad I'm coming back to Gower Street where there are live people to talk to. This is in contrast with Oxford, which he regards as brain dead. You just can't get a good conversation going scientifically at Oxford. He's full of self-loathing for taking up the Oxford position. He took it because it was uh, 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 such an esteemed position, but intellectual life happened around UCL. So we get that, that line in a letter. And then a few days later, we get something more. The only reason why this metal business annoys me is that it will make it still harder to interest men here. This is say at Oxford. Those who were at Cambridge will regard it as a sort of official answer to our little row, which they may accept without taking any further to make up their own minds. Some who have seen this morning's times where it was reported have been good enough to express their view to me already. Otherwise, Bateson is trying according to his lights and he deserves the encouragement he wants as well as anyone else, I suppose. And do remember that Weldon proposed Bateson for his fellowship of the Royal Society. So we have here at least uh, one participant's sense that the Royal Society's action at that moment in awarding this prize to uh, William Bateson had a decisive impact on the way in which people read the direction scientifically that things were going in their debate about Mendelism. It looks like a vote of confidence on Bateson's side rather than Weldon's. Possibly the more wounding, and that last, that last phrase is, is the more kind of self-governed, if you think about how much Weldon gave to the society uh, from, from 1890 forward. Okay, let me bring things to a close with a couple of concluding reflections. Uh, first, about uh, the Royal Society and the role that it played in the battle over Mendelism, as I put it in my title. Uh, and secondly, about the significance uh, of all of this for us now. So I've emphasized three, as I've called them, traditional but progressive features of the Royal Society. Uh, in facilitating communications, in hosting committees where people interacted with each other, had to conduct business, and also in, in making public commendations. And, and what I've tried to bring out are the ways in which the forms that these took at this moment, the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, were consequential for the ways that the Bateson-Weldon relationship and more largely their scientific debates went. In some respects, I think we can say the Royal Society intensified things. Uh, one of my uh, favorite sayings is that you don't really know what you think until you disagree with someone. And by forcing close quarters in the way that the Royal Society at this moment was keen to do for its own purposes, one might think that uh, the personal as well as intellectual relations became uh, more extreme. One might think ultimately for the good, that's you know, to be discussed. But it seems to me that the setting up of that February 1895 meeting, 
deliberately, deliberately stoking disagreement in a public way. Right? So who, who can intellectually humiliate the other right, in a public setting? Uh, uh, and, and, and secondly, uh, the way that the committee functioned to bring these people together over and over again, even though neither of them particularly relished it. They saw it as their duty as society fellows uh, to, to participate. Uh, with the, with the, third, uh, the third element that I, that I talked about, commendations, uh, it seems rather the reverse, not so much an intensification as a letting of heat out. Not necessarily in a way that Weldon welcomed, but the giving of a prize at a moment like that, when everything is still up for grabs in a scientific debate, could, at least in Weldon's view, prove to be influential, maybe even decisive, in helping people make their investment choices from that point forward. So I think if we focus in on what's specific and distinctive about the Royal Society at this period, we can actually learn new things about this debate as well as new things about the society, things which take us some way from the Newton Hook Boyle image of the society. Let me turn finally to whether and how this might be significant. Whether or not Weldon was right about the impact of the Darwin Award in influencing investment choices when it came to the science of inheritance, I think there's no question that history on the whole has not been overly curious about Weldon's perspective on these topics. On the contrary, with his death in 1906, his views, which were most fully articulated in a manuscript theory of inheritance that he had almost but not quite finished when he died. Uh, that manuscript has lain there ever since. Uh, I, but I'm happy to report that with a colleague of mine at the University of Leeds, Annie Jameson, we're now closing in on completing a scholarly edition uh, of this manuscript, which we hope will go some way to uh, returning it to the conversation because what one finds there is so fascinating and so unlike what you're prepared to find given the way that historians write about this debate. It's not remotely the case that Weldon didn't get it, that is, he didn't get the Mendelian perspective and therefore didn't like it. On the contrary, he really did like it, but he thought it was limited in what it told us about inheritance. From a Weldonian point of view, the Mendelian generalizations are special cases, instructive for their purposes, but really they ought to excite our curiosity in finding out about the conditions that enable those patterns to persist when and where they do. But they aren't in any interesting way representative. So that's one thing we're doing, uh, is to uh, try to bring this, uh, his work back into the light. The other thing that we're doing, complementary to that, is uh, developing an alternative curriculum in genetics, which in a Weldonian spirit, which is rather in tune with the spirit of some themes in present day genomics, starts students off not with Gregor Mendel and his binary P characters, which is still how they start a hundred years later, but rather with something else, something much more representative. We haven't yet made up our minds what to start with, but we want to find a way of bringing students to think from day one about heredity and environment interaction as fundamental, as pervasive and primary. And our hunch is that students exposed to this kind of a curriculum, a Weldonian curriculum, kind of counterfactual curriculum, you know, what would biology textbooks look like if Weldon hadn't died? if he'd been more successful in recruiting allies to his cause. Our hunch is that these students will be less prone than students coming out of a Mendelian perspective to embrace a kind of determinist attitude about genes, an attitude that biologists themselves have long ago dispensed with. But there's a case for saying that the pedagogy of biology perpetuates it in spite of that. So those are two ways in which we're investigating what might have been when it comes to Weldon's inheritance. And I think, depending on the outcome of all of that, we'll be, able, we'll be better able to gauge the significance of the debate and the Royal Society's place within it. So 
uh, watch this space. Thank you. Well, thanks, Greg, for a really interesting talk about the uh, interactions between individuals and ideas and institutions, which is obviously something we're very interested in here at the Royal Society. Um, we've got uh, time for questions, so um, can I take uh, some questions? Yes, one and then two. Yeah. Um, so, are the ideas of well and then potentially valid and useful and interesting? just that they lay buried for a century, um, partly perhaps because of the actions where they seemed to win the debate and then he died, of course, so that kind of closed it. Or was, were some of his ideas just disproved and discarded at a certain point? Or is it just one of those open things that people haven't focused on? You know, has it got a point? That's a, that's a very interesting question. Uh, and I think both things happened. That is to say that um, a, lot of, a lot of what Weldon had to say got absorbed in critical dialogue with the Mendelians. Uh, so, um, by dint of his followers, his supporters? No, not necessarily. Not necessarily because, uh, so one can see Bateson from 1902, and, and, and Bateson here is characteristic of many zealous intellectuals. You know, they'll bitterly disagree with the critic in public, and then quietly backstage fix their theories <laughs> in ways that accept that the other guy kind of had a point. Uh, and, and over time, so over time, the Mendelian perspective becomes very sophisticated, much more sophisticated than it was in 1902, and much better able to handle what had appeared to Weldon to be uh, fundamentally uh, uncomfortable phenomena. That said, the assimilation of Weldon's points is done on Mendelian terms. And I think that's, it, it, it's potentially significant. So Weldon, what, what isn't adopted is Weldon's view that the Mendelian concept of dominance has no place in biology except in special limiting cases. So dominance seen to be permanently associated with the character. A, uh, if, if a factor for yellowness is present in a pea, then on the Mendelian perspective, it doesn't matter what else is going on in the pea's hereditary constitution or around it. The pea will be yellow. Weldon takes that to be a concept of dominance, which he thinks is outdated in biology in 1902. And he thinks it's outdated because of the previous 20 years of experimental embryology, all of which in his view, and a lot of his book is devoted to this, shows us that what gets expressed biologically depends not on the nature of a tissue, but on what, to, what it's interacting with, what's next to it, what kind of an environment it's in, how hot it is, what the chemical nature is. Uh, so that point of view becomes, on the one hand, easily built in to the Mendelian perspective, but just as an aside. It's not fundamental and central. And what I'm fascinated in, in investigating is the extent to which it matters, what you put on the center and what you put on the periphery in organizing a, a system of knowledge. So, so that, that wasn't taken up. Thank you. I have two points to make, really. One is very important, is that one of the confusions and the impediments to understanding why it is that the Mendelian system is not always, as you put it, binary, either or, mm -hmm. is because many things are polygenic rather than monogenic and therefore th there is room for chaos or apparent chaos to ensue. Um, there was a famous case it, with Mendel himself that his boss Nagali famously uh, removed Mendel from the course that he was taking and gave him orange hawkweed to study and ho orange hawkweed is one of those plants which as you probably know is is 
infamous for, for, be, for not breeding true. And the minute you, you start to get other factors coming into the equation, it starts to look chaotic. It's certainly not, but it's so complex that you find it difficult to find a way to explain these things. Antirhinums are one classic example that was, was remedied some years ago. And so um, as you, you get um, complexity, the argument seems to start to hold that there can still be such things as saltations or punctuated equilibrium, as, as Stephen Jay Gould put it. Mm. But that argument has been um, uh, completely disproved. And Richard Dawkins particularly gives profound and ineluctable arguments as to why you... Um, there can be, never can be such a thing as punctuated equilibrium in the real sense. And when, we, when it appears to be so, it normally, it always, in fact, turns out to be uh, epigenetic causes. And every 10 years, something comes up and they say, can this be saltations or punctuated equilibrium? And it never is. It's always epigenetic, genetics. Uh, that was my first point. Uh, <laughs> another, another question. Well, uh, well, well. Thank you for that. I, I, um, I don't see myself as carrying a torch for uh, saltational evolution, uh, nor for Darwinian evolution. I, uh, that's just not my not not my battle. It's fascinating to reflect, in this case, that with Weldon, again, this goes against things one is prepared to find. With Weldon, we find someone who, in opposing the Mendelian perspective, does so on what he thinks of as Darwinian grounds. And furthermore, uh, he, he regards the Mendelian perspective as inconsistent with what's already known about chromosomes. Now, William Bateson is one of the few dropouts in early 20th century biology when it comes to marrying together the chromosomal view of inheritance and the Mendelian view of inheritance. He has, it, it would take us too far from present purposes to go into it, but he has a very different view of what's going on physically to bring about Mendelian patterns. Uh, so from, as it were, looking back, if you were to ask which of these gentlemen is most on the side of present consensus, it's not actually William Bateson, the Mendelian, even though we teach all of our students at every level Mendelian genetics on day one because he was anti-Darwinian, anti-chromosomal in a complex way. Uh, 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 and on Weldon's reading, by being Mendelian, indifferent fundamentally to environmental interactions with heredity, which he thought in the light of circa 1900 biology was wildly misguided. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, talk. Um, bear, uh, bear with me for a moment. The um, philosophical transactions of which oh. we have on view here, uh -huh. um, s from 1750 something onwards, has carried what they call an advertisement at the front of it. And I'll read, if I may, just a little bit from it. It says, um, it is necessary to remark that it is an established rule of the society to which they will always adhere, never to give their opinion as a body upon any subject, either of nature or art, that art meaning manufacture, that comes before them. Never to give their opinion as a body on any subject that comes before them. And therefore, the thanks which are frequently proposed in the chair to be given to the authors of such papers as are read to their accustomed meetings, um, or to the persons through whose hands they receive them, are to be considered in no other light than as a matter of civility, in return for the respect shown to the society by those communications, mm -hmm. and so on. <laughs> so, uh, in other words, the, the, the fact that people came to talk to the society or published was simply, um, this is interesting science, rather than we, the Royal Society, thinks that this is true. And that is now, and that, that, that notice was published in the journal for 200 years, and it sort of stopped sometime after the Second World War mm -hmm. because it was sort of obvious. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but you were raising alongside that the point that giving a medal is perhaps different from publishing and in some way is perceived as the vote going down on one side. Is that right? I, I, I certainly suggested that Weldon, that Weldon seems to have seen it like that. Uh, in, in, in the case of the Darwin Medal being given to Bateson so close in time to their public skirmish in Cambridge. Uh, as he says, it'll be that much harder for me now to interest young minds in my point of view. Uh, and as I say, I, I haven't seen this point represented in the historical literature on this debate. Uh, and it's uh, also, I, I should have said that um, the, quite how the Royal Society sees the giving of prizes is an interesting question and not one I know enough about. Uh, one of my colleagues at Leeds, uh, univers uh, uh, Graham Gooday, was suggesting to me that in the fields that, that, that he knows about in, in physics, uh, it was sometimes the case that a medal or other sort of prize could function as a way of balancing out what was seen to be otherwise a kind of an imbalance of some kind. So, for example, if, if within a community or a sub-community, let's say, uh, some people were seen to have profited over much from patenting at the expense of others who were intellectually just as important, that a prize might, a medal or a prize might somehow equalize things. Uh, so uh, your points are well taken. Thank you. The whole business about how you manage, sorry, how you manage accolade, mm. and in a way the Royal Society, mm. by not by any attention necessarily, is in the business and always has been in the business of of doing accolade. And as you say, that's a mm. uh, highly delicate social activity. Mm. So it's and, and you know, th thank you very much. Uh, and and uh, the little bit of further looking I've been able to do on this. Uh, it is printed in the relevant set of minutes. Who else was up for discussion that year? And the choice wasn't Weldon versus Bateson. Uh, it was Bateson versus Hugo de Vries, one of these three European rediscoverers of, of Mendel, uh, which again suggests that on the inside, it perhaps wasn't seen as a, uh, as a, as a taking of sides in that debate. It'd be good if, if, if there exist further documents throwing light on this, I'd be glad to find them. Uh, thank you. Um, I was just wondering about um, Carl Pearson. Yes. Um, particularly in relation to your comment about various aspects of Weldon's work do get absorbed. Mm. And of course, Pearson um, thought very highly of Weldon and, you know, quite openly admitted that Weldon was a big influence on him and he admired him greatly. Um, so I'm wondering if you've seen anything of that in, in, in this, well, I was going to say love triangle, between um, Weldon, Galton, Bateson. Um, how does Pearson feel about this and how does it influence, um, necessarily influence him championing some of Weldon's views at the time? Well, you're absolutely right. Uh, the, the Weldon Pearson relationship is very important to each of them. And, to, and so they, they've, they've left, a, there's a very rich documentary archive uh, because Weldon, who had a beautiful, beautiful penmanship, uh, wrote sometimes twice a day to Pearson with his, his latest ideas. And, and Pearson was a great supporter. So uh, Pearson set up a lecture series at UCL in the winter 1904-1905 so that Weldon could get his ideas together for the manuscript that he was trying to write and, and present to an audience of people who might be able to appreciate and follow along. You know, and if this is very much the action of a friend trying to help uh, a buddy who has too many things to do and, and might, might just need the external stimulus to, to pull thoughts together. And it does prove to be immensely effective for them. And he writes very movingly after Weldon dies about just what he'd lost, what, 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 what kind of a friend that he'd lost. Uh, 
with Weldon. But to come on to at least one element of this, quite, this larger question of what gets absorbed intellectually, I haven't talked about it at all here today, but the counterpart to the classic Mendelian pattern and the Mendelian explanation of that pattern that you get on Galton's side at this moment is something that gets to be called the law of ancestral inheritance. And it's sometimes represented as a mathematical series. You know, one equals one half plus one quarter plus one eighth. And there was never any consensus on quite what this represented. But the intuitive thought was that on a Galtonian perspective, in the influence uh, dies off regularly as the generations pass, hereditary influence, but it never goes to zero. So the half represents the parental contribution to the present, and the quarter represents the grandparental contribution, and the eighth, the grand, great-grandparental contribution, and so forth. And one of the, so on the one hand, there is a feature of the Galtonian stroke Weldonian stroke Pearsonian view, which I think has just kind of vanished from our signs of inheritance, which is an expectation of atavisms. That is to say, an expectation of returns, morphologically, things you haven't seen in a while. And indeed, an attempt to find regularities governing atavisms. On the other hand, there are ways in which a lot of what's represented by that law are absorbed. And there's a whole branch of genetics called quantitative genetics. And from a certain point of view, quantitative genetics is biometrical techniques given a Mendelian gloss. So a lot of the, the, the um, technical work, but even the conceptual innovations that uh, went along with the, <coughs> the Pearson, Weldon, Galton point of view, are adopted for all of the non-Mendelian phenomena that everyone recognizes from the start to matter for a science of inheritance. Uh, but in making sense of them, one uses very different tools than you use to make sense of the Mendelian patterns. So there's a way in which these two sciences get taken up together and both get classified as part of genetics but operationally are very different from each other. Uh, so anyway, that's one, one I, I, I hope to be able to find out more about that, but it does seem to me that quantitative genetics represents um, uh, the largest part of the assimilation of, of what Pearson and Weldon had to offer uh, as students of inheritance. Unfortunately, we've gone slightly over time. I know there's a couple more people who want to ask questions, but perhaps you could come and ask uh, Greg afterwards. Um, so uh, we'll finish up here, if that's all right. Um, can I just say to you before you leave, um, it would be very helpful if you could fill out the feedback forms that you may be sitting on uh, in your seats there, um, especially if you're new here. It's, uh, it's very kind of you and uh, helpful for filling out those. Um, uh, we do have brochures on the history of the building if you're interested. Um, they're new and uh, written by Rupert, my colleague. They're on sale in the library for three pounds, very, uh, very reasonable. And they do contain some information about Burlington House as well as uh, Carlton House Terrace. And finally, uh, do come back next week where we have more controversy in the Royal Society. Uh, we have uh, Professor George Rousseau from Oxford speaking about um, Sir John Hill, who wrote a number of rather scathing attacks on the Royal Society in uh, the Georgian period. Uh, but uh, now let's please uh, thank Greg again for a really interesting talk. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming.